So one of the few lessons I recall from my business school days is the make or buy decision. So big companies often face a choice. Should they make something in-house or outsource it to a supplier? Now, the decision depends on many factors, but a big part is cost. Will it be cheaper or more reliable if you invest in in-house production? Or does it make more sense to pay someone else to do it? Decisions about whether or not to learn something are often kind of similar. For any conceivable skill, you can either learn to do it yourself, hire someone else to do it, or just avoid doing it entirely. Consider programming. You could learn to write code, you could hire a programmer to do it for you, or you could choose work in projects that just don't require you to create any new software. Or language learning. You could learn to speak Mandarin, hire a translator, or just avoid doing business with monolingual Mandarin speakers. The same choice applies to countless other skills, from understanding the tax code, to applying medical advice, repairing drywall, or planting a garden. You can learn, outsource, or avoid. Learning rarely makes sense in the short term. So one common feature of this problem is that the costs of learning rarely make sense if you're only thinking about the immediate problem. Even if you're the smartest person on earth, hiring a Mandarin translator, Java programmer, or car mechanic to deal with your problem still takes less time and energy than learning to solve it yourself from scratch. Yet, if you already know how to solve a problem, doing it yourself is often, and not always, the most effective option. Hiring people takes time, increases the possibility they won't understand or be able to deliver exactly what you want, and it can be more expensive. So viewed this way, the optimal point for many learn or delegate decisions depends on your prior expertise. This analysis suggests that you should do what you're good at and delegate what you're not good at. Now the major wrinkle in this approach is that your level of expertise is in constant. It varies depending on the amount of practice you've had on the problem. One of the most famous empirical results is the power law of practice, suggesting that many aspects of proficiency follow a roughly power law relationship with the amount of practice you do. So the answer to the learn or delegate decision doesn't depend only on your current level of expertise, but also on how often you expect to perform the skill in the future. So if you're currently below the competency threshold where doing it yourself makes sense, but will probably use the skill a lot in the future, the total lifetime cost of learning may end up being less than delegating. Now, while I'm using an economic lens here, the reasoning still applies outside of your job. So how much I enjoy painting as a hobby depends on how good I feel I am at it. And thus there's often an implicit learn or ignore decision with recreational activities that follow the same trade-off. Do we underinvest in learning? So to summarize, Many decisions about learning have the following features. One, doing it yourself doesn't initially pass a cost-benefit test. Two, the more you practice, the lower the cost becomes. And finally, whether it's worth it to learn something depends on a far-sighted calculation of how much you expect to need to use the skill in the future. Now, unfortunately, our intrinsic motivation system is remarkably short-term in its focus. Immediate costs and payoffs influence our decision far more than long-term ones. Experiments show people often pay steep discount rates for delayed rewards in ways that are inconsistent with any rational approach. Now this suggests that we may be under-investing in learning. We're disinclined to practice skills that fail that initial cost-benefit analysis, even if our investment of practice would be profitable over the course of our entire lives. So this was an insight that helped Vat and I when we were learning other languages. The cost of practicing a new language is relatively high when you're not consistently using it. In the short term, forcing yourself to interact in the new language is also costly. But if you practice it enough, speaking the language of the country you're visiting becomes easier than sticking entirely within an English bubble. Adults are also resourceful, so they frequently find ways to avoid using an unfamiliar language, and the consequence is that few get anything close to the level of exposure that young children can't help but get when they're learning. Matthew effects in learning. So another consequence of this basic model is that we should expect Matthew effects in learning. Now the Matthew effect was first coined by the sociologists Robert Merton and Harriet Zuckerman in their study of elite scientists. Eminent scientists often get more credit than unknown researchers for similar work, meaning that over time, eminence tends to compound while less famous academics linger in obscurity. Later, the psychologist Keith Stanovich applied the same insight to reading skills. Those with slight advantages in early reading ability had slightly reduced cost for reading new materials, and this led to them practicing more, further reducing the costs of reading. 
Given the connection between reading and other forms of learning, he even hypothesized that an early reading ability might bootstrap intelligence by making it easier to acquire other skills and knowledge. Research bears out Stanovich's hypothesis. In a study looking at identical twins who varied in early reading ability, the slightly more proficient twin later showed gains in intelligence compared with their genetically identical sibling. Skills beget skills, knowledge begets knowledge. Specialization and focusing on strengths. Okay, so at this point, it's helpful to clarify. I am not suggesting that since learned skills get easier with practice, we should do everything for ourselves and never delegate. This is false, even by the basic logic I've spelled out here already. Some tasks simply aren't encountered frequently enough to cross that cost-benefit threshold. I may never have an opportunity to speak Mongolian, so even if I meet a monolingual Mongolian speaker, I'd be happy to lean on Google Translate. Additionally, we can't consider skills in isolation. Spending time learning one thing is an implicit decision not to learn something else. I could learn French, but that would be time taken away from learning Mandarin. I could learn JavaScript, but that also means that I can't spend that same time learning Python. Ultimately, specialization, not self-sufficiency, is the road to abundance in the world we live in today. We delegate the vast majority of skills in our lives, not because learning them all is impossible, but because getting really good at one thing makes sense when it's relatively easy to delegate everything else. In my case, for instance, despite spending years learning programming, I do virtually none of it for my own business. Given that writing is central to my business, I don't have enough time to do all the writing I'd like. Hiring other people to do the programming makes more sense. Those people, in turn, tend to be much further along the expertise curve than I am because they've made a similar decision, except to specialize in programming and not writing. Now, that being said, there are many instances where skills can't easily be delegated. Now, I might be able to hire out behind-the-scenes programming for my website, but it doesn't really save effort or cost to hire someone to read the research used to write the articles. If I don't understand the research, I can't really weave it into the text I'm producing. In other cases, delegation is an imperfect or inconvenient substitute for being able to do something yourself. So relying on a translator is not really equivalent to being able to speak the language yourself when you move to another country. Being able to read a text isn't made redundant if someone narrates the text to you out loud. Thus, being able to speak the language of the country you live in and being able to read are skills that are almost certainly worth mastering if you're in a situation to use them a lot. Thinking about learning in the long term. I find it useful to keep in mind a few things when I face resistance to learning something new. So the first is how much can I expect this skill to get easier with more practice? One way to estimate this is to look at people with varying degrees of experience. How much effort does it take them to do what you currently struggle with? The learning curve is quite steep for some skills. You get good relatively quickly. For others, the curve is flat for a long time. You may need to practice for years before you feel that it's worth the effort. Second, how much would I use the skill if I were better at it? So supposing you could reach the relatively fat part of the practice curve, how much would you actually use it? So if you live in a country that speaks a language that you don't currently know, learning the language would definitely pass the cost-benefit test. Learning a major world language that you might use for work or educational context also probably does. A niche language that isn't spoken very much? Eh, maybe not. In this case, you may only find it valuable to learn if you have a strong intrinsic motivation to learn it. If a skill is central to your career, it may be easily worth the cost even if it's initially difficult for you to learn. In contrast, a career skill that doesn't really fit well with your existing skills may go unused even if you're nearly an expert. It's just simply cheaper to outsource. Third, how much would I enjoy the skill conditional on being better at it? Economic rewards aren't the only motivation. If you're good at something, you tend to enjoy it more and draw more personal satisfaction. But that's more true of some skills than others. You might be particularly proud of being able to paint a realistic landscape, but not really feel too special about being able to file your taxes quickly. Deciding when it makes sense to learn isn't trivial, but given that our intuitions may often give us a misleadingly short-term picture of what's possible, it can be helpful to think more deeply about it.